COVID in pregnancy. This presentation is based on the Royal College guideline, which is published in October 2020. COVID-19 is caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2. And as you all know, it was uh, first discovered in uh, Wuhan in China uh, towards the end of 2019. This transmitted by human to human transmission. The virus exists in respiratory droplets, secretion, feces, and vomits. It requires close contact for transmission. It does prove that vertical transmission exists, which is a transmission from the mother to the baby. However, it is not common and luckily it is not affected by mode of birth, breastfeeding, or mother and baby staying together. For clinical picture, pregnant women are not more likely to be infected compared to non-pregnant women, and if infected, usually they will suffer from mild or moderate cold flu-like symptoms, and they are less likely to suffer from fever or myalgia if compared to non-pregnant women, Studies found that the most common symptoms are fever in 40% of women and cough in 39% of women. However, symptoms like dyspnea, myalgia, loss of sense of taste, and diarrhea are less common and they affect about 10% of women who are infected with COVID-19 during a pregnancy. For clinically severe illness, which is manifested by a pneumonia and marked hypoxia, studies found that severe illness is more common in old age, immunosuppressed, uh, people with chronic condition like diabetes, cancer, or chronic lung disease. So it is relatively uncommon in women of reproductive age. And if severe illness affects a pregnant woman, usually it will be in later pregnancy. However, it was found that ICU admission is more common in pregnant women with COVID if you compare that to non-pregnant women of the same age. Severe illness of COVID-19 increase the risk of preterm birth. It's actually three times the background risk, and this preterm risk uh, almost heterogenic, either because of maternal compromise or fetal compromise, and because of the urgency of the situation, this lead to increased risk of cesarean section delivery as well. Risk factor: There are certain factors which increase the risk of either being infected with COVID or increase the complication once you are infected, like being of pain background, which is black, Asian, or ethnic minority background, having high body mass index, pre-existing comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension, older women living in socioeconomic deprivation, or healthcare and other public facing occupation as they are in close contact with the public most of the time. As we discussed in the risk factor, as being one of pain background increase your risk of COVID-19, so studies actually was looking why people of pain background has that increased risk. And there was different theories, like people of pain background may, may have some socioeconomic deprivation, some genetic factors which may contribute to difference to response to a COVID-19 infection, Vitamin D deficiency is one of the most strongest theories now and the reason behind that is they found that vitamin D deficiency increased the risk of the acute respiratory distress syndrome which is found in COVID-19 and at the same time people of pain background have a thick pigmented skin which increased the risk of having vitamin D deficiency and hence the UK recommendations advise giving vitamin D supplementation to all pregnant women and advice for pregnant women from pain background to take advice urgently without any delay once they are concerned about the health of the, their own health or their babies and at the same time there is a clear recommendation for all healthcare providers as well as maternity units to be aware of the increased risk of COVID-19 in pain background and increase the risk of complication in this group and accordingly, they should have a very low threshold to review these patients, admit them, and escalate their management uh, to the NDT approach because they can deteriorate suddenly and quickly. Effect of COVID-19 on the fetus? Fortunately, till now, COVID-19 was not proven 
to be associated with increased risk of congenital abnormalities, fetal growth destruction, stillbirth, or neonatal death. The only increased risk was increased risk of preterm birth, which is mostly atherogenic, as we said before. For antenatal care during COVID-19, routine antenatal care is the rule. So antenatal care shouldn't be changed through COVID-19 pandemic, except if the woman is self-isolating or infected. Having said that, there can be some modification to the antenatal care in order to maintain social distance measures. The nice recommend schedule of antenatal care should be offered in full wherever possible and this appointment should be face-to-face -face appointment to the woman should attend, in particular women of high risk group like those of pain background, high pregnant index, or pre-existing comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. NICE recommends that virtual appointments can only be offered if examination is not required and there are no additional risk factors. It is recommended to have a screening for diabetes as per NICE guideline. If possible, it was found in the first wave of pandemic that screening for diabetes was modified to include HbA1c and fasting blood sugar instead of the traditional oral glucose tolerance test. And this was done as service modification during COVID pandemic. However, it leads to missing of some cases of mild gestational diabetes. That's why the recommendation now to provide screening for diabetes according to NICE guideline as long as it is possible. Women should have an open access to their assessment units and to their service, and they should be encouraged to attend if they have any concern about their health or their baby's well-being. Continuity of care should be provided during COVID pandemic. Women with hearing or communication difficulties may find it difficult for lip breathing with the wearing mask, so healthcare professionals must be aware about this group of women and the way they are communicating with them. Basic assessments such as blood pressure measurements, urine tests, synthetic fundal height measurements should be provided to the woman in the routine care. Ultrasound scan appointment should be offered alongside other clinic appointments so the woman shouldn't need to come to the hospital or the clinic for different times to have these different appointments. And if virtual appointments are indicated as in periods of local lockdown or self-isolation, Healthcare workers must be aware about the limitation of virtual appointments like insufficient internet access in their mobile device or their computer devices at home. There are challenges in relationship building between the woman and the healthcare professionals and sometimes unvoiced concerns which the woman may have about their well-being or about their fetal well-being. So the healthcare workers should do their best and also identify these unvoiced concern during these tough times. Influenza vaccine is safe at all gestation and women should be encouraged to have flu vaccination as is protective from flu during pregnancy. Mental health awareness, healthcare professionals should be aware about signs and symptoms and especially the red flags which highlight that the woman is at risk of committing suicide in the last Empress, which was published during COVID, it was found that suicide is the second leading cause of indirect death. And it was mainly with women who complained several times from mental breakdown and they asked for help and support, but they were not seen or assessed as a result of COVID pandemic. For smoking, carbon monoxide test has been paused. We should ask about smoking status at booking as, as well as till six weeks and women should be referred to stop smoking support if needed. Continue folic acid and vitamin D supplementation. Provide support for high risk group like homelessness, substance misuse, being a asylum seeker, experiencing domestic abuse and mental health problem. Domestic abuse. Healthcare workers must be aware about the risk of domestic abuse, especially at times of local lockdown and self-isolation. Women shouldn't be left alone with an abused partner because of the local lockdown, and they should be encouraged to speak and have a free access for support. Healthcare professionals must provide the necessary support for women who have safeguarding concerns. 
For women who are extremely vulnerable, pregnancy shielding, and those who have missed appointments, extra care must be provided for them. So shared waiting areas should be avoided. Care must be provided in a single room whenever possible, especially for those who were previously shielding. There must be a named midwife or a consultant to coordinate care for women who are unable to attend the appointments because of self isolation or having a positive test. There must be a system in place to support women who have missed appointment, especially if it's for self isolation or a positive test, and either reschedule the appointment if in, if in person appointment is needed or convert to a virtual if possible. Personal protective equipment. There must be adequate personal protective equipment for healthcare staff and face mask or face covering for women and their partner in line with the national guidance. If woman was suspected or confirmed with COVID and, and phone the maternity services, so please consider other differential diagnosis. For example, if the woman complain of fever, it can ha she can have urinary tract infection or coriomyelitis, which is serious. At the same time, if woman is complaining of shortness of breath, pulmonary embolism must be excluded. So please be aware about other differential diagnosis for fever, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath. Symptoms suggestive of COVID, the woman must be encouraged for self-referral for SARS-CoV-2 testing. The woman was possible or confirmed COVID-19 and hospital attendance is required, or she presented herself to the hospital. In this case, women should be encouraged to attend via private transport, and if an ambulance is required, the call handler must be alerted about the COVID status of the woman or any household contact with the woman. Maternity staff should be alerted by mobile phone upon arrival to the maternity unit before the woman can attend any of the hospital building, and at the point of entrance, the woman must be met by staff wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and he provides the woman with a fluid resistant surgical mask and this mask shouldn't be removed until she is isolated in a suitable room and the woman should be transferred immediately to the isolation room and stay there till the end of her care so the isolation room should ideally contain all the items which are required to provide the required care for the woman and only essential staff who is wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment should be allowed to enter the isolation room Minimize the number of visitors to the isolation room according to the local hospital policy. All non-essential items must be removed from the isolation room prior to the woman's arrival and all clinical areas must be cleaned following the use. Antenatal care for women after recovery from COVID. Actually, this will depend on whether the woman had mild or moderate symptoms or the woman has severe symptoms which require the ICU admission. So for the first group of women who had mild or moderate symptoms or even no symptoms and they didn't require any hospital admission, so there should be no change to their routine antenatal care. Apart from any missed antenatal appointments because of self-isolation, it should be seen and offered as early as possible. But for women who recovered from a period of serious or critical illness or, or required hospital admission and ICU admission, so their ongoing antenatal care must be planned together with a consultant of obstetrician prior to hospital discharge. And we should offer them fetal growth scan within 14 days following the recovery from this serious or critical illness. Also, we know that there is no evidence that COVID-19 can increase the risk of fetal growth infection, but still women who recovered from serious or critical COVID illness should be provided with fetal growth scan within 14 days or even earlier if there, are, if there is any clinical indication for that. So lumbar prophylaxis, women who are self-isolating at home should stay well hydrated and mobile. However, if concerned about the risk of VTE during the period of self-isolation, clinical VTE risk assessment in person or by virtual means should be performed and lumbar prophylaxis should be considered and prescribed on a case-by-case -case basis. Consider infection with SARS-CoV as a transient risk factor and trigger reassessment. If thromboflaxis is indicated, it should be offered and administered, and we should follow the local procedures to ensure women are supplied with low molecular weight heparin, particularly where they cannot attend the hospital during period of self-isolation. For venous thromboflaxis, 
Healthcare professionals should be aware that infection with SARS-CoV-2 is a transient risk factor for thrombosis and trigger reassessment. So for women who are self-isolating at home, advice must be that they should be well hydrated and mobile. However, if there is any clinical concern about their VTE risk during the period of self-isolation, there must be a clinical VTE risk assessment. This can be done either in person or virtual. And if thromboflaxis is indicated, it must be prescribed and delivered to the woman. If thromboflaxis is indicated, it should be offered and administered as per routine care following the Royal College guideline for venous thromboflaxis. And we must ensure that women are supplied with a thromboflaxis agent like low molecular heparin, particularly when they cannot attend the hospital because of self-isolation. Continued thromboflaxis commented for pregnant women who are self-isolating until they have recovered from the acute illness, which is between 7 and 14 days. Seek advice from a clinician with an expertise in VTE for women with ongoing morbidity and limited mobility. All pregnant women admitted with a confirmed or suspected COVID should be offered prophylactic low molecular weight heparin unless birth is expected within 12 hours. For women with severe complication of COVID, discuss the appropriate dose regime of low molecular weight heparin with a multidisciplinary team including senior obstetrician or clinician with an expertise in managing VTE in pregnancy. All pregnant women who have been hospitalized and have had confirmed COVID should be offered thromboprophylaxis for 10 days following hospital discharge. Consider a longer duration of thromboprophylaxis for women with persistent mobility. If women are admitted with confirmed or suspected COVID within 6 weeks postpartum, they should be offered thromboprophylaxis for the duration of their admission and for at least 10 days after discharge, consider extending this until 6 weeks postpartum for women with significant ongoing morbidity. So COVID-19 is a risk factor for thromboembolism should trigger reassessment either during antenatal or postpartum. For labor and birth, we classify the woman into asymptomatic low risk and symptomatic or high risk. If a woman is asymptomatic and low risk, but she had positive tests within the last 10 days, if she wished to give birth in home or midwifery lead unit, it is recommended that an informal discussion around the place of birth take place with the midwife. CTG is not recommended solely due to positive test, should only be used if it is required for another reason. However, we need to discuss further monitoring options with the woman, acknowledging the current uncertainty in women who are asymptomatic with positive tests for SARS-CoV. So what about symptomatic positive cases? Women with mild symptoms can be encouraged to remain at home self-isolating in early latent phase of labor consistent with routine care. Offer a test to women who have symptoms suggestive of COVID. If there are no concerns regarding the health of either the woman or baby, women who attend the maternity unit and would usually be advised to return home until labor is more established unless private transport is not available. Provide women with the usual advice regarding signs and symptoms of labor, but also inform them about symptoms that might suggest deterioration related to COVID and advise them to call back if concerned. For symptomatic women, birth is recommended to be in an obstetric unit. On admission, there must be full maternal and fetal assessment, including assessment of severity of COVID-19, assessment of vital signs, pulse, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation. There must be an assessment for confirmation of the onset of labor, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, once the patient is admitted, there must be an MDT approach discussing the care for the patient. This MDT includes a consultant obstetrician, neonatologist, intensivist, consultant anesthetist, and a named midwife to put a plan for the best care for the woman case by case. There must be an hourly monitoring of the vital signs of the woman. Oxygen therapy should be titrated to aim for saturation above 94% continuous electronic fetal monitoring during labor, fetal blood sampling and fetal scalp electrode are not contraindicated, so they can be done as according to the NICE guideline for management of labor and birth. Only essential staff to enter the room and staff should be wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment according to the hospital protocol. 
If the woman recovered from COVID without requiring admission to hospital, no change to planned care during labor and birth. Following hospital admission for serious or critical COVID illness, needing supportive therapy, informed discussion, and personalized assessment, consider both the growth of the fetus and the woman's choice. As there is no evidence of what is the appropriate way for fetal monitoring, as the evidence of fetal distress is based on small numbers of babies born to a woman symptomatic of COVID and theoretical risk extrapolated from pregnancy affected by fetal growth restriction in women with other coronavirus, so discussion with the woman about the fetal monitoring, either to offer intermittent cultation or continuous electronic fetal monitoring, taking into consideration the absence of solid evidence to recommend one approach. Support and encourage women to have birth partners. However, if birth partners are symptomatic or in period of self-isolation, they should remain in self-isolation at home. Ask all birth partners whether they have experienced any symptom suggestive of COVID in the preceding 10 days, like fever, acute resistant cough, a change in, a loss of, a change in or loss of sense of a smell or taste. If they have had symptoms within the last 10 days, Ask the birth partner to leave the maternity unit immediately and self-isolate at home unless they have had a negative test result from coronavirus since symptom onset. If they have had a fever within the last 48 hours, ask birth partner to leave the maternity unit immediately and self-isolate at home regardless of their test result. Ask birth partners to wear a face covering, remain by woman bedside, not to walk around the ward or hospital, and wash their hands frequently, restrictions on visitors should follow local hospital policy. For time and mode of birth, informed discussion with the woman, personalized assessment and informed decision, whether it is beneficial overall to delay elective birth or induction of labor and any associated appointment for women who are self-isolating because of suspected COVID in themselves or in household contact, in women with symptoms who are becoming exhausted or hypoxic, there must be a discussion about an option to shorten the length of second stage of labor with instrumental birth. Senior obstetric or medical infant, when urgent birth of the baby is required, to aid supportive care of a woman with severe or critical COVID and vaginal birth is not imminent. Consider whether the benefit of an urgent cesarean birth outweigh any risk to the woman. And in this case, you have to follow the advice on personal protective equipment for cesarean birth and inform the woman and their family that donning personal protective equipment for emergency cesarean births is time-consuming, but it's essential, and this is have an impact on time it takes to assist in birth of the baby, consider this during decision-making and, where possible, discussion during birth planning. Water births Water births is not contraindicated for women who are asymptomatic of COVID-19 and the presumed or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 negative providing adequate PPE can be worn by those providing care. However, for women who are symptomatic of COVID-19, with cough, fever, or feeling unwell, labor and birth in water is not recommended. For women who are asymptomatic of COVID-19, but test positive for SARS-CoV, there is inadequate evidence about the risk of transmission of the virus in water. Healthcare providers should be aware that the integrity of PPE, such as face masks, could be compromised when it becomes wet. For labor analgesia and anesthesia, Internox can be safely offered with a standard single patient microbiological filter. There must be an informed discussion with the woman about the use of epidural analgesia, its benefit, its risk. The studies shown that use of epidural can be beneficial as it can avoid the use of general anesthesia if urgent birth is required. Personal protective equipment follows the national recommendation on the use of PPE in clinical setting. Multidisciplinary discussion about the likelihood of a woman requiring general anesthetic. For a cesarean birth where general anesthetic is planned, personal protective equipment including FFP3 mask and visor, don the PPE prior to commencing with general anesthesia, develop local standard operative procedures to determine the type of PPE required in cases where regional anesthesia for cesarean births cannot be administered or is ineffective. Clinical curation during COVID pandemic. If the woman attend with a fever, investigate and treat as bacterial sepsis in pregnancy, 
This type of COVID should be offered in addition to blood culture. While pyrexia may suggest COVID, don't assume that all pyrexia is because of COVID. So please, there are other differential diagnoses of pyrexia in pregnancy, in particular chorioamnitis. So think about other causes apart from COVID. Consider possibility of bacterial infection and perform false sepsis screening. Administer intravenous antibiotics when appropriate. Consider bacteria rather than viral infection if the white cell count is raised. Lymphocytes as usually normal or low with COVID and commence antibiotics. Offer testing for COVID to women if they meet the national inpatient or community public health criteria, which are loss or a change in sense of smell or taste, in isolation or in combination with any other symptoms of COVID, clinical radiological evidence of pneumonia, acute respiratory stress syndrome, fever of 37.8 or more, and at least one of the following, acute persistent cough, hoarseness, nasal discharge, congestion, shortness of breath, sore throat, wheezing, and or sneezing. Perform radiographic investigation as for the non-pregnant adult. This includes chest x-ray, CT scan of chest. Chest imaging is essential for the evaluation of unwell women with COVID-19 and should be performed when indicated and not delayed because of concern of possible maternal and fetal exposure to radiation as maternal would being is paramount. Consider diagnosis of pulmonary embolism or heart failure for women presenting with chest pain, worsening hypoxia, respiratory rate more than 22 breaths per minute, particularly if there is sudden increase in oxygen requirement, or in women whose breathlessness persists or worsen after expected recovery from COVID-19. Consider additional tests to investigate for possible differential diagnosis, electrocardiogram, CT pulmonary angio, echocardiogram. Care for pregnant women with deteriorating COVID. Obstetricians should be familiar with local protocols for the initial investigation and care of women presenting to medical team with possible COVID. Follow these protocols for pregnant women as far as possible including initial investigation, management of fluid balance, and escalation of care to involve the critical care team. The priority for medical care should be to stabilize the woman's condition with the standard therapy. Monitor po both the absolute value and trend of hourly observation, including respiratory rate and oxygen saturation. Be aware that young fit women can compensate for a deterioration in respiratory function and are able to maintain normal oxygen saturation until sudden decompensation. Escalate urgently if any of the following signs of decompensation develop. Increase in oxygen requirement or fraction of inspired oxygen above 40%. Increase respiratory rate despite oxygen therapy or respiratory rate more than 30 breaths per minute. Reduction in urine output, acute kidney injury, drowsiness even if the oxygen saturation are normal. Titrate oxygen flow to maintain saturation above 94%. Apply caution with intravenous fluid management. Monitor women with moderate to severe symptoms of COVID using hourly fluid input output chart. Aim towards maintenance of neutral fluid balance in labor. Try bolus in volume of 250 to 500 ml and then assess for fluid overload before proceeding with further fluid elicitation. Have a low threshold to start antibiotics at presentation with early review and rationalization of antibiotics if COVID-19 is confirmed. Even when COVID-19 is confirmed, we mean open the possibility of another co-existing condition. Don't delay administration of therapy that would usually be given intravenous antibiotics in women with fever and prolonged reduction membrane in women with suspected COVID. Until test results are available, treat a woman with spread COVID as so it is confirmed. Arrange an urgent MDT planning meeting for any unwell woman with suspected confirmed COVID. This should ideally involve a consult of a situation, consult a nutritionist, midwife in charge, consult a neonatologist, neonatal nurse in charge, intensivist responsible for obstetric care, and the infection control team. This should be shared with the woman, her family if she chooses. Consider the following. Key priority for medical care of the woman and her baby and her person preference. Most appropriate location of care, intensive care unit, isolation room in infectious disease ward, or other suitable isolation room, and lead speciality, concern among the team regarding special concentration in pregnancy, particularly the health of the baby. 
review all pregnant women with suspected and confirmed COVID who are in hospital with a concerted administration even if they are not admitted to the maternity unit. A designated team member should be responsible for regular updating the woman family about her health and that of the baby. Assist all pregnant women for risk of VTE and prescribe prophylactic dose thromboprophylaxis. If they are suspicious of VTE, prescribe subiotic dose thromboprophylaxis. Thrombocytopenia is associated with severe COVID-19. For women with thrombocytopenia, take less than 50. Stop aspirin prophylaxis and thromboprophylaxis and seek hematology advice. Consider using mechanical aid such as intermittent pulse compressors if thromboprophylaxis is both secondary to thrombocytopenia. Be aware of possible myocardial injury as symptoms are similar to those of respiratory complication of COVID-19. Be aware of the interim government guidance based on the result of recovery trial, which states that steroid therapy should be considered for 10 days or to hospital discharge, whichever is sooner, for adults unwell with COVID-19 and requiring oxygen. In pregnant adults, use orabenzolone 40 mg once daily or intravenous hydrocortisone 80 mg twice daily. Consider the use of antiviral medications that have been shown to potentially beneficial in COVID-19 and enrollment in clinical trials for which pregnant women are eligible. If there is clinical uncertainty about whether to offer a therapy to a pregnant woman, seek advice through maternal medicine network, consider the frequency and suitability of fetal heart rate monitoring on an individual basis, accounting for gestational age as a maternal condition. Make an individualized assessment of the woman with the MDT to decide whether emergency cesarean birth or induction of labor is indicated either to assist efforts in maternal gestation or where there are serious concerns regarding fetal condition. Given the well-being of the woman highest priority in the assessment, consider maternal condition, a change in oxygen saturation, radiological change and respiratory rate, fetal condition potential for improvement or deterioration following aerogenic birth and gestation. If maternal stabilization is required before intervention for birth, this is the priority, as is in the other maternity emergency. If urgent intervention for birth is indicated for fetal reason, expedite birth as for normal obstetric indication as long as the maternal condition is stable. Within the MDT, including both obstetric and medical clinician, consider the benefits of administration of antenatal steroids to fetal lung maturity and magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection, where indicated by NICE or Royal College guidelines. Together with the possible risk of administration in a woman who is severely unwell with COVID, do not delay urgent intervention for birth of their administration. For postnatal care, keep women and their healthy baby together in the immediate postpartum period if they do not otherwise require maternal critical care or neonatal care. Support women with suspected or confirmed COVID to remain together with their baby and to practice skin to skin care if the newborn does not require additional medical care at this time. Adopt a precautionary approach for a woman who has suspected or confirmed COVID and whose baby needs to be cared for on the neonatal unit to minimize any risk of woman to infant transmission, at the same time inform parents in decision, mitigating potential problems for the baby's health and well-being and for breastfeeding, bonding and attachment. Support women who choose to breastfeed even if they have probable or confirmed COVID Hold a risk and benefit discussion with neonatologist and families to individualize care in baby who are maybe more susceptible. Recommend breastfeeding to all women where safe and feasible and offer support, advice and guidance on breastfeeding to all women who wish. Inform family that infection with COVID is not contraindication to breastfeeding. Support family in the feeding choices and inform them of the risk and benefit of feeding baby in close proximity to individual with suspected or confirmed COVID. When a woman is not well enough to care for her own infant or where direct breastfeeding is not possible, support her to express her breast milk by hand or using a breast pump and or offer access to donor breast milk. The following precautions should be taken to limit viral spread to the baby. Consider asking someone who is well to feed the baby. Wash hands before touching the baby, breast pump or bottles. Avoid coughing or sneezing on the baby while feeding. Consider wearing face covering or low resident face mask while feeding or caring for the baby. Baby shouldn't wear face mask or other face covering as they may risk suffocation. When women are expressing breast milk in the hospital, dedicated breast mask pump should be used.
Adherence to recommendation from bumpy cleaning after its use. Adherence strictly to sterilization guidance for babies who are bottle fed with formula or expressed milk. Postnatal care for women and babies following admission with COVID-19. Advise all households to self-isolate at home for 14 days after birth of a baby to a woman with COVID-19. Safe sleeping, smoke-free environment, careful hand hygiene, infection control measures when caring for and feeding the baby. Provide families with guidance about how to identify signs of illness in their newborn or worsening of the woman's symptoms and provide them with the appropriate contact detail if they have concern or question about their baby's well-being. Advise any woman or babies requiring readmission for postnatal obstetric or neonatal care during a period of self-isolation for suspected or confirmed COVID to telephone their local unit ahead of arrival. Advise guidance and support in relation to their postnatal physical and mental health and well-being and the care of their newborn baby. This includes necessary in-person assessment using appropriate BBE, postnatal care up to 8 weeks after birth, offer in-person home or clinic appointment to allow an overall assessment of the physical and psychological health and well-being of the woman and her baby. In some areas where appropriate, some postnatal care will need to be via telephone or video link because of local infection rate and staff absence, but consideration needs to be made upon individual circumstances. Communicate this to the woman and the family.